Good morning, church. Good morning. Once again, thank you so much for uh, having me back here. Uh, I want to thank the church for the kind invitation uh, to preach at uh, SCAC, both the main campus and here this year. I really appreciate it. Um, as we enter December, uh, you know, the arrival of Advent, uh, let me take this opportunity to wish each and every one of you and your family a very merry and blessed Christmas to come. Uh, today, we are going to wrap up our 3V series that Jesus proclaims about himself. And as we read earlier uh, from the scripture, John 14, 5 to 7, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. We started the series in April talking about Jesus being the way. And in August, we focused on Jesus being the truth. And as I walk into the building today, Brother greeted me, we're going to wrap up today and talking about the life. <laughs> So, in so doing, we will have cover uh, <clears throat> Jesus being the way maker, Jesus being the truth teller, and most important of all, and I have to tell you, the message is supposed to be so simple and yet so profound. Jesus is the life giver. And uh, today's sermon is a timely one as we talked about the fact that today is the first day of Advent, the four weekends, or the four weeks, so to speak, not weekend, the four weeks before the arrival of Christmas. I could not have planned it so well. <clears throat> Nothing is more appropriate than starting the Advent by speaking about Jesus being the life. And I don't need to tell you how significant Christmas is not only to us Christians, but to the entire world. The coming of Jesus represents the coming of a new life. As John put it so well from the get-go of his gospel, in a way that described Christmas, really different from the other three gospels. Well, actually, not other three gospels, because if you look at the gospel of Mark, he hardly talked about the birth of Jesus. But if you look at the gospel of Matthew, and the Gospel of Luke, both Gospels talked about the birth of Jesus as a series of his historical events. But John, ah, John has a different take. In John 1.4, John said, In him was life. In him was life. And that life was the light of man. John was not portraying Jesus' birth in the context of a series of historical events, as I said earlier. He's really focusing on Jesus as a life giver that shines into the darkness of the world. And Jesus' point is so timely because we are living in a world that is deep into geographical conflicts, mired in political and policy fights, <laughs> policy fights, 25%, right? The guy down south said, when I come into power, you're going to have to pay another 25% more. <laughs> this is a chaotic world that badly needs Jesus and the coming of a new life. Speaking of new life, I want to ask this question. How many of you are cancer survivors? I wish none of you. Okay, two. Thank you for being so brave and raise your hand. I guess most of you don't know that I'm actually a three-time cancer survivor. I don't know what I share this with you. 2011, nasopharyngeal cancer. And that's why I lost 25%, uh, 75% of my saliva. That's why I have to drink water. I lost most of my hearing. Today, I put on my hearing aid. I could still hear, that's why when I talked to Pastor Chris earlier, I keep turning left. You notice that? Because even with hearing aid, this guy is gone. 
2016, oral cavity cancer. And then while they were treating the oral cavity cancer, they discovered that this little guy, they call it MPC nasopharyngeal carcinoma, came down here. So one and two and three. 2017, I went through a whole bunch of treatment. What you also don't know is that two years ago, in August and September, as part of the follow-up of the, of the um, oncologist, I first took CT scan. The radiology came back and said, ah, it looked like it has come back again here, down in the, this part of the, the lung. Let's do a PET scan. And if you in the medical field, you know what a PET scan is. It's supposed to be pretty, <laughs> according to the language of the younger generation, pretty lit, right? <laughs> it actually lit up in terms of minor detail of the presence of cancer. And both radiologists came back after they read the scan, concluded my cancer in my right lung has come back. Right? And uh, according to them, there's really no need to conduct a biopsy. Why? Because you walk like a duck. You quack like a duck. <laughs> you must be a duck. You had that history. So what did they do? Schedule a surgery. Cut off one third of my right lung, lower right lung. You guys like steaks? How many of you do not like to have a steak? Raise your hand. Okay, there's no veggie. No vegan in here. Right? I love having a steak, right? But usually when you have steak, the steak is this size, right? The one third of my right lung that they cut off, the dimension was 11 centimeter by eight centimeter by 10 centimeter. However, five days ago, two years, that was exactly one month after my surgery, I received the pathological report. And it basically said, no cancer was found in the specimen. It cut off one third of my lung to tell me that there was no cancer. Oh. One of my students basically said, Professor Wong, why don't you just sue the hospital? <laughs> Get some money back, right? I'm telling you, I was just so thankful at that moment that 2011 I was healed, I got new life. New life again, new life again, and then, yeah, I have to get one third of it cut off and new life again. So if anyone who can testify to what it means to have a new life, I think I kind of qualified a little bit, right? But you kind of have to ask the question, is it all? Is it, is it what Jesus talked about being a physical new life? If we dig deeper into God's word according to John's gospel, we can see that Jesus proclaimed, I came to give you life and life more abundant. Here the gospel tells us clearly that the life that Jesus talks about is much, much more just simply than a physical life. He's talking about a life that is much, much more than simply providing a sustenance, keeping you alive, that type of new life. He's talking about a life that is completely holistic and completely fulfilling. That's why he called it abundant. What does it really mean? Well, like I said, the topic is so simple and yet so profound. And again, I'm gonna to stick to my three-point sermon. <laughs> I'm going to come up with, I'm going to share with you the three dimensions of this important teachings of Jesus with you. These three dimensions are invitation to choose, calling and purpose, and seeding and flourishing. And let us take a deeper dive into each one of it a little bit. 
first invitation to choose. Now in this summer, at the pushing of my younger daughter, uh, I purchased <laughs> a nice coffee machine. Now one of the things that really surprised me was that it actually offers so many choices I, don't, I didn't even know, right? Uh, you know what, I'm a basic kind of a guy, right? If you go to Europe and order a coffee, the first thing, you know, the, the barista look at me being Chinese kind of a guy, and usually say, you're from Hong Kong, you're from China. No, I say, I'm from Canada. Oh, you need an Americano. <laughs> For me, I just want to have espresso. Sometimes double, sometimes even quadruple. My wife's sitting here. She is a cappuccino type of a lady. Sometimes latte. I didn't know there was a thing called flat white until I get the machine. So many choices. And that reminds me of the thing that when I was conducting research of uh, local born in terms of their faith journey, one of the things that they impressed upon me was they value choices. We all heard about the slogan, and I'm not saying here that I'm here to drill on it. I don't even necessarily agree with it, but you heard about the slogan, my body, my choice, or my voice, my choice. I simply want to point out that making choices, or making the right choices for that matter, is vitally important. Choices mean freedom. Choices mean having the right to exercise self-determination. But folks, I want to tell you that was not the case in Jesus' time. For the Jewish people, they lived in Jesus' time. They were completely ruled by Roman empires. They had no freedom. They had no choice how they could lead their life. And that's why most would desire to be free and to be liberated. And the Jewish people at the time was craving for the coming of the Messiah, as we read the Bible, you can see it very clearly. So that the Messiah can breathe in a new life, give them a new hope, and provide them with a new vision. Just like the Israelite of the old, they are looking for a Messiah to lead them into a new promised land. And I'll say to you, when Jesus said, I am the way, he's saying that I am that life that would bring you the freedom, so choose me. When he said that to the Jewish people at that time, I believe that he had that kind of idea in mind, that during the parallel between the Exodus experience and the new promised land, Something that the Jewish people at the time was very, very familiar with. You may remember when you go read the first five books plus Joshua, that before Joshua led the Israelite into the promised land, God asked Moses, and you can take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 to 20. God asked Moses to remind them that they need to make a choice. They need to make a choice between life and good versus evil and death. Why? Because God knows really well at the time that when the Israelites enter into the promised land, they would be bombarded and tempted with different religions and different gods of the land. And not only that, once they settled down and settled in, at one point in time in my life in Toronto, this is like decades ago, a Canadian friend of mine grabbed me by the shirt and said, Wong, let me explain to you the difference between settling down and settling in. <laughs> when Israelites settled down and settled in, they're going to build their own houses. They're going to have their own vineyards. 
They do their own things. You know, this is a younger generation, right? You do you, right? God, you do you, I do me, right? <laughs> Not only God would become secondary, he would be forgotten, abandoned, totally disobeyed under those circumstances. Before all these things happened, God grabbed them by the chest, just like my Canadian friend grabbed me by the chest. Make that choice. Make that choice between life and good versus death and evil. And I, I can argue, I can argue that the picture kind of resonates with our situation today. We live in a world that offers so many different perspectives, so many appeals, so many attractions, and for that matter, so many distractions, right? So many things for us to chase after, but the question remains, are we chasing after God? You see, having choices is good. Making the right choice is important. And Jesus is inviting us to choose him. So folks, I will say to you, that is our takeaway number one. Just like the invitation extended to the Israelites of the old by Yahweh, and to the follower of Jesus' time, in the same way God is inviting us to choose life today. A life that would beckon us to follow him closely and single-mindedly. Jesus is saying to us today, come, choose life. Come, choose following me. Most importantly, come, choose me. And when you choose life and choose to follow Jesus, he'll give you a new calling and a new purpose. And that is the second dimension I want to share with you this morning. And this is right out of the promise that Jesus made to his disciple. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I came, ah, I came, that they may have life and have it abundantly. About a month and a half ago on October, well, almost two months ago now, on October the 10th, the Nobel Prize Committee announced the South Korean Han Khan was chosen to be the 2024 Nobel Laureate in Literature. When I read the news, I was somewhat surprised because as early as two days before that, I read from The Guardian, a Chinese author concert was considered to be the favorite to win it. The bet was 10 to 1. <laughs> you, can, you can see that there was actually a bet going on, right? But when I look further into the life and the writing of Hans Kahn, I was completely, completely struck by the central theme of her prestigious work. And that theme is best summarized by the question she poses in one of her writings. And she asked this question, she said, if you were able to live as you desire, in other words, free to choose, right? Free to go, free to do whatever you want. What would you do with your life? I know it sounds like a cliche, right? But it is an important question to ask, what do you do with your life? What is your calling? What is that purpose that God has laid in your life? Now this question reminds me of a sermon I preached and uh, I asked uh, Pastor Aaron this morning, see, he couldn't remember, but I did preach down in the main campus maybe a few years ago about this young man, American young man, Nathan Hale. But, uh, if you know Nathan Hale, an American back in 1750, she was a, he was a, a soldier, a spy, a patriot for the Continental Army. 
uh, he actually volunteered himself to be an intelligence gathering spy in New York City, but he was quickly captured by the British and executed. But before he was executed, someone caught him said this, and this is his famous saying, I only regret that I have but one life to give for my country. In other words, his purpose is very clear. He dedicated his life for his country. And the Lord is asking us, what is our purpose? Can we do the same thing and dedicate ourselves to live the life for God? What is our calling? What is our purpose? I say to you, the question is so fundamental to where we are right now in the world. So much struggles, so much chaos, so much what I call FUD, F-U-D, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Where do we go? Whom do we follow? Who would inspire us and who can enrich our life with meaning and purpose? Is it, is it Donald Trump, you think? And I asked the following two, the younger guys down in the main campus couldn't even figure out what's going on. Is it Elon Musk? <laughs> okay, okay, the Chinese guy, I know he's a Chinese guy, Jensen Huang. <laughs> You don't know who Jason Wong is? Oh, you, then you're not investing enough. <laughs> He's the CEO and the founder of NVIDIA, the number one, com uh, number one company in the world, right? I'm sure they can give you some kind of purpose, but I say to you, what they can give you would only lead you to power, position, and prestige of this world. But Jesus, ah, Jesus offers a totally different paradigm. When he said, I am the life, he is calling us. In fact, he is transforming us to live our life that is driven by his love, his compassion, and his redemption for the world. Because the world is desperate in need of Jesus. And in this regard, I can tell you Paul totally gets it. Before he became a Christian, he too was chasing power, position, and prestige. And how do we know that? I don't have the passage here, but let me read it for you. From Philippians chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. He said, I was circumcised, uh, circumcised on the eighth day, so I'm, I'm pretty religious. I'm of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. You see, I got fantastic pedigree. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, pure. I'm not mixed. In regard to the law, I'm, I'm a Pharisee, very enviable status. As for zeal, persecuting the church, quite an accomplishment. As for legalistic righteousness, Outless, what a devotion. He was so proud of his track record, and yet on his road to Damascus to persecute Christian, Christ encountered him. Christ shed his light on him, just like what we read this morning. The life comes just like light into darkness. Paul's life was completely changed, completely transformed. Now, after he became a Christian, he only got one purpose and one purpose only to live. For him, to live is for Christ. To live is to gain Christ. To live, none other than Christ himself. And fundamentally, folks, this is what being a Christian is all about. Being a little Christ, right? That's what Christian means, right? Being a little Christ. Living out Christ in our life. That reminds me of a saying by uh, Max Lucano. Max Lucano said this. To call yourself a child of God is one thing. To be called by 
To be called a child of God by those who watch your life is another thing altogether. In other words, living out Christ's life is not something that you kind of talk to yourself when you just whisper to yourself. It is a weakness. It is an expression. It is a lived experience. Living out that life. So the people can say, yeah, he is indeed a follower of Jesus Christ. Being a Christian and being a follower of Christ is to fulfill that calling and purpose of living out the Christ in you. A life that is only possible if you choose life and allow Christ to transform you. He'll take the ordinary you and change it into an extraordinary Christ-like, Christ-centered followers of his. And yes, he can, if you allow him. You may feel being unworthy, but he can, just allow him. This week, I heard this story, I don't know whether you heard it. This was about a banana, which is worth less than a dollar. And yet it got turned into being worth 6.2 million. You guys heard about the story? Ah, thank you. That means you're watching the news. <laughs> the story is about an art piece that has a banana duct tape on a frame that was sold on November 20th at a controversial, and I would even say outrageous, auction in New York City. And the guy who won the bid happens to be a Chinese cryptocurrency entrepreneur. So he must have gotten a lot of bitcoins. Okay, you laugh, that's good. So when I talk about Jensen Huang, you didn't know who he is, but when I talk about Bitcoin, you know what it is. <laughs> His name is Justin Sun. By the way, today is first. Two days ago, on November 29th, he held a press conference at the iconic, if you have been to Hong Kong, you know this hotel, Peninsula Hotel. He took that frame with the duct tape on the banana and he had a press conference. He took the banana down, ate it, he said it tastes pretty good. I'm sorry if I say something that offends you. Damn right it tastes good. It costs you 6.2 million. <laughs> it tastes good. <laughs> After the transaction, someone went to look for the, the grocer or the fruit seller who sold the banana. They said, hey, your banana worth 6.2 million. No way, I only sold it for 25 cents. And by the way, I'm totally broke. I'm not like that guy who pays 6.2 million. You see, in the hands of an artist, the banana is no longer just a banana because the banana duct tape on the wall is actually a conceptual artwork called comedian. Don't ask me why. It was an artwork by the Italian artist Maurizio Catalan. How could a cheap piece of banana, 25 cents, became so expensive? Well, I tell you what, if it happened in Toronto, you're gonna to sue law laws, right? because they price gouging. <laughs> it is still the same physical banana, but the secret sauce, so to speak, is because it was worked on by an artist. To the artist, Italian guy said this, Tutu Bani. Okay, you're looking at me like I'm from Mars again. Everything is good, right? Of course, the other guy looked at the auction, did not say Tutu Bani. They say, tutu mati, everything is crazy. <laughs> we may not agree with the valuation of the artwork, but in the eyes of the one who won the auction, in the eyes of the one who created it, it's worth every single penny. And to me, when I found out this, I was reading the story of Mary pouring the ointment on Jesus. 
what is the worth of that one? Jesus says, priceless. Just like your master card. <laughs> priceless. Our life is indeed ordinary. Somewhat useless. But when we entrust it in the, in the hands of the Lord, who can work way more magically than an artist such as Mauricio Catalan. Our ordinary life and trust in his hand will become extraordinary because he can transform our lives with purpose and he can elevate our values for the kingdom's purpose. Not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Who's he? Christmas time, wonderful counselor, mighty God, Father, Prince of Peace. So the takeaway number two, I suggest to you, entrust your life to the Lord. Allow him to transform you with his life, his calling, and his purpose. He can definitely Definitely change the ordinary you into an extraordinary follower of Jesus Christ. How do we lead a life that is Christ-like, Christ-centered, that is fulfilling the riches that is promised and given by Jesus? And that is about the third dimension of our message this morning, seeding and flourishing. Jesus said this in John 12, 24 to 26. He said, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of what falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Uh, for a life to be fully fulfilled, you need to go through the process of seeding, growing, and then flourishing. On Saturday, February the 17th, I woke up by BBC News that the Russian activist, Alexei Navalny, uh, who was actually a, a best known critic of the uh, Russian government and Putin uh, at home and abroad, uh, he was trying to fight for uh, an opportunity to really establish true democracy in Russia. And the news said he died in a Siberian penal colony. You see, Navalny was ordered to be killed. He was supposed to be part of an exchange to be shipped out of Russia in exchange for Russian spies who were captured and caught abroad. But Putin, and the last minute changed his mind and killed him. Why? Because he was such a great influencer. By killing him and ending his life, Putin was exerting his brutal power of tyranny and control to silence his voice. His life mattered because his, his influence touched upon not only Russian, but many people around the world as well. But when I contrast his death and Jesus' life, I can tell you this. I can tell you this. <clears throat> Jesus' life mattered much more to the world because his fear of influence is everywhere, every corner of the globe. It's not restricted to one country, Russia. Not restricted to one ethnicity. He sacrifices life in exchange for yours and mine. You see, Christmas is not about Jesus coming so that he could have a party. When I was young, before I was, I was a Christian, I loved Christmas because I have this jingle, right? Christmas time, party time. <laughs> 
Jesus did not come so that he could have a party. He came with a mission to redeem the world by sacrificing his life so that we can all be reconciled with God the Father. Redemption can only come from Jesus. And Christmas is all about that redemption. But with Navani's news, I kind of can't help but ask myself this question. Why was he so willing to die for what he believed in when many did not or don't? I kind of come to this conclusion. And this is something that a friend of mine in the Alliance Circle said to me. See, Jesus, as he said, Enoch, this is a lot of people's attitude. I like the cause, but I do not like the cost. I like the cause, but I do not like the cost. We all know a month ago, Donald Trump was elected as the new president of the United States. Many argue that democracy are at stake, not only in the US, but in many, many other places. And by the way, that's why when you take a look at the stat, Americans searching Google, how do I move to Canada? Search 35%. But I say to you, the church and God's kingdom, humanly speaking, are as thick as well. Are as, are as thick as well. In terms of its growth, and in terms of expansion. And the Lord is looking for those who are willing to go through the seeding process to sacrifice themselves for the cause and yet still be able to bear the cost. He is looking for those who are willing to sacrifice like going through the seeding process, as I said. Only then can growth and flourishing happen. And I suggest to you, that many before us have done that as a good example. Because as I was preparing for this, I can't help but think of an event that took place 124 years ago in 1900, back in China. There was an anti-foreigner movement, a xenophobic movement in China at the time called Boxer Rebellion Movement. Many foreigners were killed, including missionaries. And CNMA missionaries were not exempted. According to the record, the Alliance lost 21 missionaries, 12 children, and three Chinese Christians assistants. But because of the martyrdom of this missionary and others who died, the church in China including CNMA as a denomination, continued to grow afterward, and many came to Christ. I was talking to an Alliance pastor last night, yesterday afternoon, not last night. He's now 83. He was recounting to me how he graduated from the Alliance seminaries in Hong Kong back in the 50s. And the Alliance Seminary in Hong Kong did not always exist in Hong Kong. It was actually first established in Guangxi province in China. And he asked me this question. He said, Enoch, do you know why the Alliance would establish a seminary in a location in China that at that time seems to be like the outskirts? Nobody lived there. I said, I don't know what I'm wrong. He's also wrong. He said, because the Alliance, the Alliance has a spirit that they want to go to places where nobody goes. That's our IW, folks. Today, our CNMA IWs continue to sacrifice themselves in terms of their career, in terms of their earnings, and in terms of their accomplishment in order to bring Christmas message to those who have not heard of Jesus. You may ask the question, so why do you know that? That they gave up their career and earning? Well, it's kind of 
instinctual, right? I mean, you, you kind of look at. I actually trying to write up a report. Hopefully, I get it done next year. I interviewed 40, 40 North American-born Chinese full-time missionaries. 18 of them were born in Canada, and five of them are actually our IWs. I can tell you, just the five IWs used to be doctors, lawyers, bankers. They could easily throw their hands. Hey, money's good, career's good. The three Ps are coming. What are the three P again? Position, power, and prestige. No, they gave it all up so that people can understand who Jesus Christ is. And the death of these martyrs actually fulfilled the saying of the second century church father, Tertullian. We don't always pay attention to him because we always focus on the first century early church, which is portrayed by the book of Acts and the New Testament. But when the time turned to second century, persecution of Christians was at its peak. In those days, the blood of the martyrs soaked the earth as believers were fed to the lions, beaten, whipped, sawed in half, put to death by sword, burned in the fire, and chained in prison. And Tertullian maintained that the more Christians were persecuted, the more they were mowed down, the more they would multiply. Because the blood of Christians is the seed of the church. Now, I'm not saying God is calling each and every one of us to die like a martyr. But I say to you, God definitely called each and every one of us to sacrifice ourselves as a seed so that it would be planted and it would, it would grow in such a way that would bless many, many others. Jesus saved us not to just to give us an eternal life. He saved us so that he can send us out. We're not all to be pastors, I get that. We're not all to be full-time missionaries, I get that. But if you read John chapter 20 carefully, each one of us is being sent out to this world. I said it to a church two years ago at, a, at an interesting meeting. I said to them, the true mark of a church is not so much about how many missionaries it sent out. The true mark of a church is whether the congregants become missionary when they leave the church. So the question is, is our life heading to wasteland or heading to graceland? <laughs> this, is, this is Elvis singing, <laughs> wasteland. I invite you to ask God to help you examine the areas of your life that you need to go through the seating process in order to live life to the fullness in fulfilling the purpose that God has called you into and ask him to transform you for that purpose. In wrapping up our sharing this morning, let us remind ourselves once again, especially in the season of Advent, that Jesus Christ did not come to enjoy a tour like Taylor Swift. <laughs> he did not come to demand his right or adoration, although he could. He came to serve. He came to be a ransom for many. And that is a life of servanthood. Jesus is the life that embodies what he teaches about him being the way and the truth. It's the whole nine yard. Life represents hope. Life represents direction. Life represents purpose. Not just simply keeping physically alive, but a lived life to the fullest and live it in a way that God intends you to be. So with that, we wrap up our three V series this year. Once again, thank you so much for having me. And once again.
Merry Christmas to you all. God bless.